All right, we want to now expand our ability to calculate work. We're going to stay in one dimension, but now we're going to allow ourselves to have an arbitrary force that acts on our object as it moves in along a straight line in one dimension. So, given that we have a straight line, that gives us uh, an important freedom, which is to choose our coordinate system along that line. Let's make it the x-axis. And so our object is going to go from some initial position, some final position. Now, what we know from before, our general form of the work, is equal to this integral from your initial position, which in this case we'll call xi, we, since we've already said we're, we're along the x-axis, this then f dot uh, dx, where this is now our infinitesimal steps along the x-axis. If For an arbitrary path, I was using s before, but we, we've already said we're going to stay in one-dimensional motion along the x-axis, so it uh, sort of looks like this. Okay, so so what does this mean? This sort of element in here is each very small amount of work, dw, that we're going to add up as we move along this path from x1, uh, x initial to x final. So if we blow up then, well let's, let's start here, we, we blow up some small amount of this path so that this is sort of our infinitesimal step that our little nanobot is going along as it adds up the, uh, as it sort of measures a force at each very small step that it takes. So it takes some very small step dx and it can identify a vector associated with that step, dx vector, and it's since we're in uniform motion, it points directly along this line. In fact, I could write that as its magnitude, which is dx times i hat, because I've decided it, it I've already chosen the x-axis to be along the direction of motion. Okay, so now let's say that at this instant in time, there's a force and this time the, the force is acting, say, over here. This is force at some, our, some initial point one. And the, my little nanobot during this, this, uh, this step can calculate this small amount of work, dw, which is equal to the force at this step, this is at this step one, dotted into this displacement vector, which, since it is along the uh, the x-axis, gives us the x-component of the force at this moment times the dx. Right. So this is equal to the magnitude of the force cosine theta dx. This is the x-component of the force at that time. Remember, the dot product gives us the component, gives us the projection of one force on the other vector times the magnitude of the other vector. So this gives us dx, which is along the x-axis, times the projection of the force on the x-axis, and that's just the x component. Okay, so now, if we do it again, sort of the, the next step, do it over here, so then there's this small dx. Now here, since our, our force is arbitrary, we could have a very different force at this time. Maybe our force is over here. However, that doesn't matter. Our little nanobot can calculate it. Our d work at that point is then equal to the force at that point, which may be different, times the um, the dx at that at that point. I guess we can give these labels too. So this is dx2. Well, that just gives us the, the x component of the force at uh, the second point times dx2. So if I add this all these up, so my work is d work 1 plus d work 2 plus dot dot dot, it is giving me then the x component of the force at each point in space, f2 dx2 plus the x component at step 3 
dx3 plus dot dot dot. So if I'm just adding that all up from infinitesimal steps from x initial to x final, I can represent this as this itself as a new integral. I can say that this integral is now the total work from x initial to x final as the x component of the force dx. Now let me make explicit that since this is an arbitrary force, it's not constant, it is a function of x. And so this could be changing as a function of x. But as long as I know the x component of the force everywhere along the path, my total work now comes down to simply this one-dimensional integral. All right. So let's let's just let's do an example. So this is now slightly more complicated than with a constant force, but it's not too bad as long as I'm still moving in one dimension. So that that's really the the key point to our simplifications so far is that all of our motion is one dimensional straight line. Okay. Let's calculate the work done by a spring. Okay. And and we have to be Again, you have to be very specific when you're calculating work about agents and objects. What is doing, which agent is exerting the force and thus doing the work on what object. So in this case, we're going to calculate the work done by spring. Okay, so the spring is the agent on some object. Okay, we're going to say the spring has a spring constant of 250, that's newtons per meter, units of spring constant. Okay. And the object moves, the object moves um, from being stretched 0.1 meters to being stretched, I won't, being stretched, I won't write it again, 0.2 meters. So the object moves um, in such a way, uh, being the object's not being stretched, okay. The, the object moves such that the spring is being stretched from uh, 0.1 meters beyond equilibrium to 0.2 meters beyond equilibrium. Okay, so what, what does that mean? Again, Remember our spring force model, the mathematical representation of the spring force depends on the coordinate system and, and how we set it up. So so let's let's do our we have our spring. Let's we're gonna fix our spring on one end. Okay, and let's establish a zero of our coordinate system. We're gonna establish our uh, zero of our coordinate system at the equilibrium position. And we're going to say uh, plus x is off to the right. Well, we know then that our object starts at uh, point 0.1 from equilibrium, and it's going to move so that it's stretched to point 0.2 meters, these are meters, from equilibrium. And we want to know what is the being what is the work done by the spring on the object? Okay, so that means we have to find the force on the object by the spring. Okay, so our spring force, given our um, spring force model, so the spring force uh, is equal to the spring constant, or constant of proportionality, times the distance um, the string is stretched from equilibrium. Okay, so since we've chosen the zero of our coordinate system at the equilibrium position, if it's stretched a, an amount x, that is the amount that the string is stretched, stretched or compressed from equilibrium. Therefore, the magnitude of our spring force is just the spring constant times the x coordinate of the object. That's great. It's along the x-axis.
so that gives that gives us the direction of the vector and it always the direction that it points is towards equilibrium position and so since our equilibrium position is here if we have a positive x the force is negative this is the direction is towards equilibrium and if it's the position is negative as x is less than zero then our spring force is positive therefore our spring the the mathematical representation of our spring force model is going to be given by this expression or in case unless it's the obvious you have to go through this series of logical steps to make sure your mathematical representation of the spring force is correct and it depends uh, entirely on how you set up your system with your picture and your coordinate system and your diagram okay so this is the spring force and from this we can calculate the x component of the spring force which then is conveniently just negative kx all right so there's the x component of the spring force and it is a a function of x and so we can now go ahead and calculate the work we want the work as it goes from our initial x position which is point 1 to our final x position which is point 2 and we need to uh, integrate the x component of the force which we've calculated to be negative kx and then the integration variable is dx and so I can do this integration um, this is negative k is 250 the indefinite integral of x is x squared over 2 and then evaluated between point 1 and point 2 and that if I put that into my calculator it gives me negative 3.75 joules. Five. You're right. So if, if I were to calculate this, the when a point two squared that gives me negative five minus. A, a, if I put point one in there, that's a minus one point two five. The minus five plus one point two five, a negative three point seven five joules. And so the work done by the spring force on the object then is negative, which makes sense because the spring the spring force itself is acting in anti-parallel to the the displacement vector, which is positive, and so the net work done is negative. So if you didn't want to calculate the work done by the spring you might want to calculate the work done on the spring so because the spring exerts a spring force given by negative xk uh, kx i hat this is spring on object then there exists another force equal in magnitude and opposite in direction that object exerts on spring and so we could then calculate that work this is the work on spring which would be equal to 0.1 times 2 positive kx dx which just changes the sign and we have 3.75 joules that's positive so again with Newton's third law force forces equal and opposite between interacting systems the agent does an amount of work on the object then the object does an an equal but opposite amount of work on the agent and that can be useful when looking at interacting systems but also emphasizes that when you're calculating work it's very important that you clearly distinguish what is your agent and what is the object on which you're calculating the work